All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join in a moment of silence for our fallen servicemen. He could say service members. You know, there's lots of options. All right. All right. So we're doing something, uh, one thing a little different this evening in response to, um, you know, feedback I've heard about it's difficult to come and sit through a whole meeting. I had something really quick I wanted to say. I'm going to um, begin the meeting with quick comments from residents if anyone has one. Um, it would be less than a minute to come and there won't be any back and forth. It's for folks who may have come, but they haven't had dinner yet. Kids are at home. They need to rush out. So I'll just open the floor right now to any quick comments. If there's anyone in the room um, who would like to just say something quickly and needs to leave. Okay, so we don't have any quick comments in the room. Uh, on Zoom, do we have a quick comment? Okay, Mr. Oros. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it, all right, my quick question is that I understand that the board submitted a list of questions to Westerman uh, for answers. Now, my question is, have they uh, provide uh, answers to your questions? And if so, are these questions and answers going to be made public? All right, so... I'd say that's more than a quick comment, but thank you for bringing that question. <laughs> of course, it, you know that can be made public. I think that's uh, anyone who would like to see the questions and answers. Um, there's nothing secretive about them. So any other quick comments though, anyone who needs to, and, and I'm happy to, to share them with you and, and anyone else. Um, anyone else on the line who had a quick comment who won't be able to stay for the whole meeting? Okay. so. All right, one more. Hi, George. Uh, this is George Salem. Um, this is a question for the mayor. Now that you've been in office for about five weeks, I wonder if you were planning a state of the village speech to outline to residents your principal goals and priorities. Uh, great idea. I will consider. I've been trying to, in the mayor's column, you know, put out information uh, similar as to you know timely information about what's going on. I did put out St. Paul's is coming this week, um, sort of a history of the last thirty years. So I will, though, I'll consider that. Thanks for the suggestion. Any timing on that, by the way? What you might do? Well, I just heard the idea, but we are going to have a meet and greet coming up May 24th. So maybe I'll try and have it by then. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other quick comments before we get to the regular meeting? All right, so thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the um, comments and reports from department heads, beginning with Mr. Baroni. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. BPW has 11 items on the agenda tonight. I'd like to direct your attention to the first item on the finance, item number three. Uh, it's a request to transfer $22,500 to repair sanitation truck to number, eight, uh, number 18, I'm sorry, 218. Uh, it has a blown motor, uh, it will require a rebuild. Uh, the second item is item number five under the finance calendar. Uh, re these resolutions are requested, correct me if I'm wrong, Irene, so we don't have to wait for the estoppel period to begin work. So once the budget is um, on June 1st, once we have funding, we'll be able to start work right away. Um, on the public works, item number 11, 
uh, request to approve two, two change orders uh, for the Village Hall HVAC, HVAC project. The first change order is for approximately $16,000 to install a new split unit for the new IT room. Uh, the cost is comparable to the system that was installed approximately two years ago in the detector's office. The second change order is for approximately $4,000 uh, to replace the uh, grills in the boardroom under the windows right here. They're kind of old and banged up, so we want to replace them with some new ones. Uh, Public Works item number 12 is a request to engage H2M for $11,000 for a biannual water storage tank inspections. The Nassau County Department of Health mandates, mandates that all water storage tanks be inspected and reports delivered biannually. This is a comprehensive detailed report on the condition of all village tanks, which includes both interior and exterior photographs. Public Works item 13 is a request to engage Pace Labs proposal for UCMR sampling for $17,400. The sampling is mandated by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, which requires water supplies to test for new list of unregulated contaminants every five years. The samples must be collected twice, six months apart. Public Works item number 14 is to request to engage Duke's root control for approximately $33,400. Uh, this is an environmentally friendly chemical treatment of our sanitary sewers uh, to control roots. They are registered with the New York State Department of Environmental Protection. Public Works item 15 is to request engagement of Crane Manning for $39,000 to provide a corridor study of Stewart Avenue. The RFP, the RFP does include language to preserve the existing green spaces, including the malls and any parking spaces. We did receive six bids for this project. Public Works item 16 is a request to engage Curate and Manning for $24,500 for a village-wide speed limit reduction study. Uh, money will be need money will need to be transferred from contingent to fund the project. We received only two bids for this project. Public Works item 17 is to enter an agreement with Frank Feely to provide professional services to the village. Uh, Frank has been an employee of the village for over 20 years. Uh, and is moving to a consultant agreement from his civil service title. This will open the position for an existing full-time employee. Frank administers a sampling program part-time, which is very complex with all the new required treatments. Um, on the award of bids, item number 18 is a request to award the bid to Galvin Brothers to replace the retaining wall at Community Park for a cost of $478,000. We received six bids for this project. Uh, and the final item for DPW is item number 19 is a request to re uh, award the installation of LED light fixtures in park field 7S, 9E, and 12 to Dennis O'Regan for a course of $22,152. Uh, we are scheduled to receive grant money from NYSERDA upon completion of this project. Uh, we, we received six bids for that project. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, John. Um... Creighton Manning, the uh, Stu Stewart Avenue quarter study. What exactly is that? I, I, I might have missed that. Uh, we are proposing to do a study for uh, uh, lane diets from re, uh, the lane, currently three lanes, reduce it to two lanes, implement some traffic calming, um, get some compliant lane widths on Stewart Avenue uh, after paving. So we're looking at narrowing the lanes or, or making two big lanes, basically. Two compliant lanes okay to wider lanes and obviously we're not doing it as it approaches franklin or clinton um once you get beyond washington approaching franklin it's different because it splays out into four lanes uh for the right and left hand turn lanes but we are talking about addressing that one issue is when you make a right on Franklin onto Stewart, that's that's an area where I'm hoping that the study shows that reducing that to two lanes uh, is a safe and proper change because those parking spaces between Franklin and St. James Place, you can't use them um, unless you're a real risk taker. Um, because there's no shelter from the traffic. And so that's one of the things like 
filling that in and making that only parking spaces, protected parking spaces. So it would definitely be two lanes from Franklin down to St. James is the starting point. And that's in response to a lot of complaints we've gotten about incidents there at that corner. Uh, so uh, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, Traffic Commissioner uh, Kelly. And thank you, John. Mr. Baroni, there has been some chatter and information about the possibility of bus traffic going down Stewart Avenue. And to what extent would Creighton Manning be in a position to address the proposals that are being put out by Nassau County? If at all. I, yeah, I, I don't know if that would fall under the scope of this proposal, um, but we can certainly ask to see if it can be done. Um, you know, one thing, the chain, change orders, um, what was the reason the computer, and this may have been before you were superintendent of DPW, but were we not going to get that information, you know, do that, add the system? Is there, why was that changed um, with intra case? Well, yeah, I think, I believe there was a plan in place to select a new location for uh, IT room for servers uh, that's recently been decided where it's going to go. So it wasn't included in the original project because there was not supposed to be an IT room. We didn't have a plan for one. So there's a separate project for relocating the computer room, which requires new air conditioning. So we have an air conditioning team on board here. So we thought it best to have them do it while they're here and, and get the room ready because that's really probably the most intrusive part of the construction. So we're just taking advantage of the fact that they're here on site. Okay. Yeah. How big is the computer room we're talking about here? It's probably about, uh, let's say, 15 by 12, something like that, 15 by. It's just a rack room with a bunch of servers and things. It's like going to be a, a, right. It's going to be a room. It's going to have the 911 system there for the police and have all of our servers. Um, but it does require climate control. We're moving, we're moving the room because the room we currently use has water pipes up and down. We've had multiple leaks in there the last few years, so we're trying to prevent a major catastrophe. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Will? Good evening, Mayor Trustees and everyone here. Um, item number one on the agenda, assessment of unpaid water rents. Um, so pursuant to village code, um, any uh, water bills or Water unpaid water bills as of today um, will be assessed on their village taxes come June 1st. Uh, and I just uh, passed around uh, as of today um, the total amount due plus penalties. The total amount that will be assessed is $289,290.89. Um, and this is from 1,007 accounts in the village. Um, item number two uh, is for the assessment of unpaid commercial sanitation charges. This item could actually be removed from the agenda. There was one outstanding item that was paid, so nothing is outstanding as of today. So item number two can be deleted. Correct. No, item number two can be removed from the agenda. That's all paid up. Um, item number four is audit services. Uh, we're requesting to re-engage PKF O'Connor Davies to perform the year, the fiscal year end audit uh, for the 22-23 fiscal year. Um, we have a multi-year agreement with them to keep the rates low. Um, and we also engage them to perform our required um, annual deferred compensation audit. It's required by New York State when um, a municipality is self uh, self administers the deferred compensation plan. Um, and that's for the 22 calendar year. All right, uh, Treasurer, just before you go on to number five, can you just comment on, on their performance? Obviously, uh, I, I would think that they've been strong, but it would be interesting for uh, the residents to hear, you know, just a quick overview of, of what they do and, and how well they do it. 
Sure. So um, uh, I believe about four years ago, we uh, put out an RFP for audit services. The previous auditors were with the village for about 16 years, I believe. Um, and so we selected PK of O'Connor Davies. They are um, very well known in the municipal world um, and their rates were very favorable to the village. Uh, they were selected and they do an excellent job for the village. They provide audit services throughout the year. Um, any kind of questions we have, uh, they, they provide assistance with us, to us. Um, and they provide all types of auditing services uh, that we require um, because we've Re, you know, uh, have in the recent years received a significant amount of federal aid. We are then required to be, to perform an additional audit. A, it's called a single audit. Um, it's required um, to ensure that the federal aid received, you know, complies with the, the 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 requirements of the grants. Um, so whenever the village receives over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, we have to do that. So they've done those audits for us as well. Um, they before, perform our year-end audit and are available to our finance and audit committee throughout the year as well. Uh, they've, they've done an excellent job for the village. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, the bond resolutions were discussed by uh, Mr. Baroni. Again, these are just, uh, these are approved projects that were in the 23-24 capital plan. And these are basically authorization, the board is authorizing us to issue bonds um, for these projects. Um, with this authorization, like Mr. Baroni mentioned, they can start working on these projects. Um, typically, we issue bonds once a year when our bans are due. That's February. So next February, we will be issuing the actual bonds. Uh, I'm sorry, Treasurer. Uh, who who performs the uh, the legal work for us on the on the bonds? So we engage a uh, bond council, which is Hawkins Delafield, and they are also uh, very well known in the municipal field. Uh, they review these projects, they provide the bond resolutions, they analyze the, the PPUs, which is the period of probable usefulness, which is what's required to, to go out to finance, the maximum amount of time you can finance these individual projects. Um, so they assist us with uh, all levels of financing. Thank you. You're welcome. One thing that came up earlier was the off-peak Long Island Railroad parking passes. <clears throat> People get them by calling your office. Is that right? Yes, they can contact uh, the finance department. Uh, we currently not at Village Hall due to construction, but we do have a box up in the uh, DPW building department area. They can drop off an application or they can call the general number um, and we can assist them. We can email an application or assist them in, in any way they need help with. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we, um, question, do we have that advertised anywhere like on the website today? I believe it is on the website along with all the other parking uh, permits that we issue. Um, and I believe it was also uh, in the mayor's column uh, this past week. Okay, cool. I believe. He was. I actually heard some very positive response about the program, um, and we may want to push it out in an alert for people who don't read the mayor's column or aren't on the website. I think it is. You're assuming there are such people. <laughs> <laughs> for the, the few who aren't reading my column. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's very welcome. Uh, Mr. Giovanelli. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. The building department has one item on the agenda tonight, um, item number eight, um, which is um, requesting board authorization to the request for a repointing of Certified Electrical Inspectors, Inc. Um, they are, are the building department third-party electrical inspectors. Uh, they've been with us since 2008. They actually perform the inspections that the building department can't perform. With, uh, perform. Um, because we're performing electrical inspectors and it has to be done by a third party agency. Um, so they've provided um, excellent service for the village. Uh, it's no cost to the village per se. It's only it's the cost is deferred to the homeowner, depending on the inspection that's performed. Um, and like I said, they've been really great as far as the team and workmanship with the village for the past uh, um, years since 2008. So I'm requesting to extend 
the additional two years for their service. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd be more happy to answer. Thank you. All right, Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, recreation has two items on the agenda this evening. <clears throat> Number nine is the change order for the HVAC work at the Senior Recreation Center. When the contractors were opening up an outside wall to go in and repair some termite damage, they had to remove one of the condensers. When they opened the condenser up and removed it, they found that it was rusted and non-operative. So we do need to get that replaced. And that is for a cost of $5,760. Also on the agenda this evening, number 10, is a license agreement with Adelphi University, use of the Olmsted Theater for our dance ensemble presentation in June. Uh, this license agreement calls for one full dress rehearsal on Thursday evening and two shows on Friday and Saturday night. The rental cost is $2,865, and that also includes all the technical services, the folks that run the sound, spotlights, the curtains, and this gives our students a chance to put on a show at a truly professional theater. Besides that, I have two quick items tonight. One is we're very happy to announce that the Senior Recreation Center reopened this past Monday on a full schedule. We have a couple of small items on the punch list, but there's nothing serious. We have a, a crew coming in on Monday to clear them up and the programs have been going on and the response has been pretty good. And secondly, sure sign of summer on the way, although the weather couldn't prove it, Pool applications will go live on our website tomorrow morning. So if you want to get down there early, get on the website and fill out your application. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, any uh, any discount for early signers? We stopped with that scam some time ago. <laughs> we just we just give you a nice low rate. I think the family rate this year is only five twenty five. Uh, we went up about three percent. The uh, the problem with trying to do an early discount or a late um, fee, people just don't like it. We get into arguments. I had my application in on Friday morning. No, you didn't. Yes, we did. So we just go one rate and it's still a bargain. So, truly, thank you very much. Hey, Paul, quick question for you. Um, can you give us a quick, quick update on uh, St. Paul's Fields? Any progress there? I did, I was driving by the other day to see them putting down some topsoil or something. Yeah. Some of the dirt. Yeah, we have a crew that goes out uh, every week after the games are played on the weekend and they take out topsoil, peat moss and seed. They fill in any low spots, any bare spots they find. We also had our uh, turf consultant in on Monday morning and he walked the fields and he came up with a couple of recommendations to try to improve the turf. We're going to start overseeding the entire field uh, weekly. Uh, he suggested that because the field is, uh, they're just getting so overplayed that it's very hard for us to keep up with the turf. We've been chatting with all of the youth groups that use the fields, and we uh, have reached an agreement where we will be shutting down a, a good portion of the field this, uh, this summer after the spring season is over. In particular, we want to take care of the small, we call them window fields, right out by Stewart Avenue where the kindergartners play. Those are in the worst shape of all the turf out there. There's, they're down to bare dirt in a lot of spots. That'll be shut down and at least one and possibly two of the full-size fields are gonna be shut down. Uh, also, we are gonna contract with the turf company to do some deep tining aeration this year. We've never done that before and uh, they're suggesting that it might work to our advantage to get that done. We will also, again, in the fall, be putting down some of the turf covers that we used last winter to try to grow the turf in the goal mouth areas, which get worn out pretty badly every year. So we're acting aggressively to try to improve the turf. We know it's not up to our standards and the effort is there and we're getting good advice from our turf company. Again, we, we do use all organic materials on that field and we've been told three to five years to see any improvement. We're just starting year four. So we're hopeful that we're gonna see some improvement towards the end of this year and going into next year but we are aware of the issues on the fields and our, our crews are working on them. Great, thank you. Glad to hear that, Paul, because I hear from a lot of residents yeah. with young Great. children and they are not happy at all with the fields. Well, and, a, and I think it's a good idea focus. to, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Um, it's a good idea that you're closing them down during the summer. Maybe that'll improve it. The, the problem that we have is even when we close the field, we, we can't close it long enough because we they're adding teams, they're adding programs, they're adding kids, which is great. We love it. The more kids we have out there, the better. But for example, we closed Grove Field 
uh, last fall, we put down, I think, 27 truckloads of topsoil, peat moss and, and grass seed. We regraded it, seeded it, started coming up great. We wanted to keep it closed this spring. But the field over at Nassau Haven has been used for so many years without a rest that after the first week, the soccer club came and said, the field's really not usable. We're going to have to reopen Grove. So instead of getting two growing seasons for Grove Street, that field is now being used. And the new grass, which is not terribly well established, is starting to get beaten up. So we have to be a little more aggressive in letting the groups know that they have to close the fields for a long enough period of time for us to really get the work done on them. And they've all been very good about it. We're getting good cooperation from all of them. Mm -hmm. And we know that this is the only thing that's going to make the grass better is if you're not beating it up 10 months a year, seven days a week, because it's not just the weekends. There are people out on those fields every day of the week. And that's what we're doing. And thank you. And, and, and I, I think you had mentioned that there's not going to be uh, any of the tournament activity during the summer, right? So that, no. that'll, that'll help as well. The, the tournaments, which, you know, the, some people like to point to them as ruining the fields. The, the tournaments were on the fields for a total of five days. So it wasn't that the tournaments were doing a lot of damage, um, but it was a perception. And with the fields being closed, we cannot give them all the fields that they want. And I frankly do want to close a couple of the fields and I'm, I'm not going to keep them open for an outside tournament if I'm closing them for our residents. So there will be no tournaments this summer. Uh, any update on the work at the mini golf when that's gonna start? Mr. Baroni and I just had a conversation about that this evening. We are having some issues trying to award the bid for the equipment for the golf course. Um, the company that we wanted to use that we want um, sent in a bid, I guess you could call it a bid, but it didn't have a lot of the requirements that we call for in terms of insurance and bonding. So we're gonna to have to sit down and work with council to see if we can accept that bid. Otherwise, the option is to go to the next low bidder, which was um, an exceptionally high bid. Uh, we know the cost of the materials. We know the cost of the installation. It should be right around 85 to $90,000. And the only bid that we got was for 195. So. As much as I want to put miniature golf back at Community Park, I really don't want the taxpayers of the village to have to pay twice as much as they should. So we're hopeful of arriving at a settlement with the low bidder. We will be discussing that on, on Monday and again, I guess, at the department head meeting. But the work has been going on. The grass, the ground has been leveled and the electrical contractor has been engaged. He's run the electrical line. So it is still, we're still hoping to get it open this summer, but you know, we have to work this out with the vendors. Any, any updates, Paul, on the tennis or the paddle courts and things like that? I know we had talked about in the budget session, wondering if there's been any progress towards it. Uh, the tennis courts, the uh, bid specifications are just about done. They're about to go out for the replacement of the skin on the tennis building. At the same time, we'll also be replacing all the LEDs in the building, upgrading them to a brighter bulb, and the courts will all be regraded. As for the platform tennis courts, we reached out to the two vendors that are east of the Mississippi to do the work. We got a quote from one of them. The other one still has not responded, although they are on Long Island and working at one of the country clubs out in Bayshore. So we're hopeful of getting a second quote for that work. And then we'll be able to sit down and decide what we can do. Unfortunately, it looks like it may have to go out to bid. Uh, the, the company that submitted the proposal is, uh, no secret here, it's RJ Riley, and they are the biggest platform company basically in the country. They are also the most expensive but they also do the best work. So uh, we're waiting to hear from the other company, uh, which is called Core Pro. And once we get their bid in, we'll sit down and look at them and determine which one is best for the village and how we can best bring them in here to get that work done. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Sure. Hi, thank you, Commissioner Jackson. Thank you, Mayor. I, have, I don't have anything on the agenda. Just uh, a couple of meetings ago, I talked about deception losities uh, when the people are dropping money by your car or they're uh, when you come and have a bank or when they, uh, they put uh, a hole in your tire and as they're helping you, another person is taking the money that you uh, put in your pocketbook on a front seat or an envelope. But now it's, uh, it's changed. Uh, it's now, it hasn't happened in the village, but it happened in uh, many places around us uh, where what they're doing, they're following people into the ATM area and then when you're finished with the ATM, they say you left twenty dollars there, and they uh, or you left your card there. And what they do, they switch the card, and then by the time you get home, there's twelve hundred dollars on your account. 
So uh, you got to be very careful. Uh, the ATM is an area where you can, it's prone to that type of stuff or can be prone. So please uh, be aware when you enter a bank, exit a bank, and also the ATMs. Uh, we're seeing a spike in, in the county, and um, and we have a lot of banks and ATMs. So that's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner, what, what's the play here? In other words, they tell you you left your card there. They give you a different card. Do they then say you must have taken mine and get you? No, no what, they, what they do is it's very... Uh, very slippery. They what they do is uh, they say that there's a twenty dollar bill there. Let's give you a card. They take the card and they try to help you with it. I and see. then when they give you the card back, it's a different card. Sure. Okay. So yeah. and then they so it's just a, just a very uh, quick uh, switch that they're doing. But they're still also doing the other the deceptions when um, they put a hole in your tire or they're dropping uh, you know money by your car and while you're picking it up, they're taking it. So it's a bunch of different. Uh, Lossity is going on, and uh, but there were a couple that turned into when somebody noticed it and turned into a robbery. Uh, not here, but uh, I just want people to be aware of their surroundings. If you're coming outside and people are watching you, maybe you stay in the bank, tell the bank, tell the call 911. Uh, it's just got to be you're just trying to help people be more aware when they uh, use the ATMs or banks. All right, thank you. And oh. Commissioner and Superintendent Baroni, I wanted to thank you for the great assistance you gave me in the last few weeks in looking at those traffic commission items before this meeting. That was all very helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Chief Kern. Good evening, Mayor, trustees. The fire department has nothing on the formal agenda. However, I'd just like to provide you some stats from the month of April. The fire department responded to 77 total alarms, of which 68 were signal eights, or lesser alarms, automatic fire alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, spills from MVAs, five generals, including two working fires, one extrication call, and three mutual aid calls to surrounding departments. I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Just want to comment, Chief Pern. I found the uh, review session you had for the fire on 7th Street very beneficial. I was glad to be there. And I think uh, you had about 25, 30 guys there and they um, asked very good questions and there was a lot more to it than just a simple apartment fire. So I'm glad you guys do that. Yes, um, as I've mentioned in the past, after every major incident, whether it be a house fire or anything that we determine as such, uh, we do a critique, a recap, what went right, what can, what's an opportunity to improve upon, opportunity for members who were there as well as those who weren't to learn. So. I'm happy you can make the last one as well as the Stewart Avenue fire recap. So thank you for your time. Yeah, Mr. Fishberg. Uh, I have nothing on the agenda. Thank you. Mr. Swazi. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, trustees. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with thanking Mr. Baroni uh, for putting those bond requests into finance because uh, by getting those done early, we capture the full 12 months of the paving season. So it's, we used to start later. We used to start with the bonds in June and we'd lose half the summer. So, uh, and we have a very big aggressive schedule. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Irene, as well. Um, I want to update, Mayor, uh, last meeting, I mentioned to you that I would need your signature on some forms. It turns out it did not need to involve you. I was able to uh, execute the um, request, the renewal for the authorized officers, myself and Ms. Altman. We were the auth uh, authorized officers a year before. And based on that um, um, email I sent to DASNY, uh, they sent me uh, another request and I filled it out. And today I actually uh, signed the grant dis dis distribution agreement, the GDA, which will now be reviewed by the DASNY people who do those things. And they will then uh, send me an executed GDA, which will give me instructions on how to process the two library grants. Uh, reminder, one was for $150,000 from Senator Thomas's office, and the second one was fifty thousand dollars from Assemblyman Ross. So, uh, we are well on the way to uh, receiving those funds. I don't know how long it will take, but the paperwork's done. Um, I want to remind residents that hydrant flushing is ongoing throughout the community through May 9th. This flushing is performed twice a year to remove sediment that accumulates in the mains, especially dead end mains uh, that are not connected in a circular fashion. The mains are flushed between eleven thirty p.m. and seven thirty a.m. so they don't interfere with your evening activities. 
uh, if you go to the village website on the home page, there's a community alert right at the top that tells you about this and you can click on it for any additional information you might want. I also want to uh, tie that into another announcement I made at the last meeting. The, the water tank is now on the SCADA system. It went live at 10 a.m. on April 24th. Uh, part of that exercise was switching, switching it off of system pressure to atmospheric pressure. Uh, and it's a great time to do it with the hydrant flushing because at night we're draining the tank and it, it goes on automatically. It, it calls for water at a certain level and fills up again. So we still have our guys monitoring at night, but the system was tweaked by, uh, by the uh, technicians who, who hook up all the alarms and stuff. So it seems to be working well. So we're, we're back in normal operation mode. Uh, next week, Treasurer Boone and I will be reviewing the general fund capital projects with Trustee Sullivan in his role as chairman of the uh, Finance and Audit Committee. As you know, we began the current fiscal year with 67 capital projects valued over $30 million. With the award of tonight's number 18 on DVW for the uh, retaining wall at the park, uh, we will have spent or encumbered over $18.7 million, or about 62% of the total in less than 12 months. Um, also, um, today I signed a uh, grant distribution request form from the Environmental Facilities Corp of New York State. That was for wells 8 and 12. Um, that This is a second payment in the amount of $2,193. $193,845.50. The first payment was over $1.4 million. This grant in total for 8 and 12 is worth 3653794. Also, uh, Wells 10 and 11 was submitted. That's a grant for $5,336,304. And all the other grant paperwork I've requested from H2M to find out the status um, because EFC uh, works with them before we submit the actual applications. So we're working on getting all those grants uh, filled out. I also want to let you know that uh, I spoke to Mr. Blake about uh, an opportunity that might exist with Adelphi University. They have a 54 passenger diesel bus, uh, which the recreation department could make good use of. So I called up my contact there and asked them if they would consider donating to us. They're about to send the paperwork down to auction it off. So he's trying to put a halt to that and see if they could work something out with us, either for a donation or a reasonable price that they would be satisfied with. So I haven't heard back from that, but that request is in Paul. And also uh, this week, I put in two community benefit fund applications. One was for $875,000, which is about $9,000 more than we expected to be uh, for the road paving, the concrete work, the drainage work. Uh, and I also put a second one in for the landscaping. Uh, I probably doubled what your estimate was, uh, Ms. Baroni, just to make sure that uh, it was covered. But uh, this is an outcome of the meeting we had with the Illinois Railroad Mayor, where we decided to put in the things we know about versus the larger one, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep chipping away at it. So, they were both received. Uh, I sent an acknowledgement to Trustee Chester when I heard back from Leslie Mesnick. So that was good. Um, that's all I have for the seat. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. On that, Ralph, you said the 875 was a little higher, but it was actually lower than what we kept hearing. That's right. And we were negotiating getting this main avenue project done. So Mr. Brony uh, was very conservative in his estimate, and then we added on a 20% contingent because you just don't know when you start executing. Right, right. And right. then even, even it's much lower than even Mr. Pratt had uh, estimated. So this is really good news as far as the fund goes. Yeah, they, they did good work. I was definitely happy with it. And then it's good that you put in for the landscaping that's going to have to go on those islands uh, right. going forward. A um, couple of questions. The grants, where, where were those grants from? I, I missed that. You kept. There's two grants for the library from the Dormitory Authority of State of New York, okay. DASNY. Okay. Um, we've had them for a long time. Um, I put the paperwork in originally about two years ago but I didn't finish this last step. And then they changed the forms. So I had to resubmit it again about eight months ago. About seven or so weeks ago, I contacted my person and said, you know, we haven't heard anything. What's going on? And she said, oh, the thing expired. The form expired. So I had to put it in for the authorization officers. Again, that was myself and Ms. Altman. And then after that, and that was all through electronic DocuSign. And then, then they, once I appointed myself as the officer, they sent me an application to now submit the application, which I did. And uh, and uh, also, Mr. Fishberg was also a contact as the village attorney. So we both submitted our forms today. So now it's in their hands. So, so this is the library. And yeah. then the water the water grants, when when uh, the emergency contaminants, AOP, was, uh, uh, was established to be uh, something we had uh, removed from the water, the New York State uh, put out through the Environmental Facilities Corp, EFC, they, they allowed grants. They had two waves of grants. So we initially put in for grants for wells 10, 11, 8, and 12. 
eight and 12 is the one I announced tonight. I spent the second payment request for, and 10, 10 and 11 is in process, already submitted. The remaining ones are part of the second wave of grants. So that paperwork is not completed yet. I asked uh, H2M for an update today. Um, I'm keeping Mr. Carey in the loop as well. So we're just pursuing the, make sure all the paperwork gets done so we can get those in process too. The more grant money we get, uh, you know, it'll be less money that of course. This, this we will have to go out for the final bonds for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last time my wife and I were driving down Nassau Boulevard, heading south and past the Nassau Boulevard station, and the wall looks horrible. I know you took the contractor off that was doing the job. Um, what, what's the update on that? So um, I'm going to, Ms. Barone can jump in. Originally, that those walls, as conceived originally, were replacement walls. Take them down and rebuild them in the same configuration. Later on, the board decided to just repair them. They did take down one of the walls, uh, which they rebuilt and looks great. The other ones, uh, there was a problem with the mortar. It didn't match. I believe we've okayed the new mortar selection, so they will be they will be replacing, uh, fixing those walls with new mortar. Okay. And we uh, there's also some additional cleaning has to be done. So uh, I'm not sure the timeline on that. John, can you comment? Yes, the expected completion date on the project is Friday, May 19th. Um, we are exploring a possible change order for some bricks that need to be replaced that were outside of what we identified because they can't be cleaned, which may extend a little bit because we need board approval for a change order. Uh, but if we do not um, we do not go after that change order, then Friday, May 19th will be the completion date. So when it's all said and done, it'll look a lot better than it does now. It'll look a lot better. And also, you got to remember, those walls were, they were in very deteriorated condition, but they were mostly hidden by overgrowth. So I've talked to Mr. Blake about this. We do plan on putting back uh, plantings there, which will take the focus off the walls 100% and add dimension and character to the area again. So it's, it's a multi-step process. So we do plan on giving you some TLC at the end. Thank you both. I just had a quick question, uh, Mr. Bruce. Which wall is this? <laughs> if you're heading south on Nassau Boulevard, it's the one closest to the railroad tracks as you're heading south. That'd be on your right. Okay. Thank you. Now, I know you're you know, you're going to continue driving or not. But... Absolutely. I'm not take my eye off the road. Yeah. <clears throat> it looks like an unfinished project. <laughs> <laughs> like from the old country? Yeah. For sure. All right. Any other, you know, one question I know we put out, thank you for putting out the notice about the lead testing is still available for village residents um, and the contact information. Are, do we still have residents requesting lead testing? I didn't the, prepare you. The pace of the testing has slowed down. I'm not sure it's uh, dried up completely, no pun intended. Um, I can check with H2M, they can give me the stats. Uh, they can tell me how many they've done each week because they're they're running their program for us. Um, okay. The, there is some updated information going out about that too. I, uh, Mr. Carrie and I have been exchanging emails on this. Um, he was on vacation this week, but uh, I've asked him to review all the, actually I've asked all the department has reviewed the website for their content uh, and possibilities, what they would like to see change, make sure the data is accurate, but the, the water area is very, uh, is ripe for improvement because, as we talked about as part of the EAB, water conservation. Um, there's there's other topics related to water that I'd like to get in there. So, uh, so that's something that Stan and I are going to work on next week, particularly just on water. Great. Um, we are just so residents know we're planning EAB. Um, Shell and I are planning a water program for June 14th. There'll be a May meeting as well, but. Um, just so people are aware after the water report has come out. Um, is there any update on the orthophosphate, the testing and how the lead results are with the amount of orthophosphate we're put in? I believe the, the next, next testing is June, um, which is required. Um, I, there was an improvement in the last round. I don't have any numbers for you, I'm sorry. I can get those for you and send it out to the board. Yeah, be good to say you have them. Hey, Mary. Um, I got something in the mail today from Kevin Thomas, where he's basically talking about um, giving a lot more grants out to the communities for water. 
I saw that actually I was going to forward to. So we want to make sure we keep our eyes out for all money related to um, lead or other water issues. Great. Thank you. Ralph, you were talking about grants. Was there any update on the FEMA grant for the St. Paul's temporary roof? You know, actually, uh, I actually spoke to our deputy treasurer today and asked her that specific question. Not knowing it would come up tonight, but I'm glad it did. Uh, we don't have any update on that. All the paperwork has been submitted. Um, there's been no movement on it, um, but I did ask that precise question today. I will see if there's anything we can do. Um, but um, everything they needed, uh, we, we gave them. So I'm not sure what's holding the decision up. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Any trustee comments on anything? All right. We'll go ahead to approval of the minutes, the April 20th minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move. I second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, actually, for citizen comments on agenda yeah, items, anyone in the room with any citizen comments on agenda items? <laughs> Mr. Alardi? Yeah. Do I have to give my name if you just said it? But Steve Alardi, Meadow Street. Good evening. Um, on item number three, can you just let us know what year that vehicle is that needs a new engine? Is it one of the new recycling, you know, not new, but one of the recycling trucks that I think were purchased maybe five years ago? I do apologize. It's not a recycling truck. I don't know the year of the truck. I oh, okay. can find that out and get back to you. No, I, I thought it was one of the recycling trucks, and I know they were fairly new. That's No, right. there was a problem with the intake manifold, the lamination inside of it, which is common defect, not covered under warranty. Um, but I don't know the year of the vehicle. I'm sorry. Okay. But I, I would assume it's not like a five-year-old truck. I, okay. I'll, yeah, it's not covered under warranty. I don't know the age of the vehicle. Okay. So I, I will find out and get back to you. Um, to, to piggyback on, on Trustee Torino's comment, I, I did see online today the information about the various possible bus routes from like Mineola to the hub. And, you know, I, I, I think really need to think about making and i understand why making stewart avenue two lanes versus three but if you do if obviously you're making them wider lanes and might be more inviting for a bus so i think that's something we really have to think about when you think about reconfiguring stewart avenue and on item 19 uh, you mentioned the led project are we getting the, the full amount back in grant money or I will have to double check the amounts uh, with you. This is the award to install the lights. Uh, we did have to purchase the lights. Uh, the full grant money is $50,000. Um, I don't believe it's the full amount because of the purchase, but it would cover the installation plus a little bit of the material. Understood. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone in the room on items on the consent calendar? I will just actually take a chance to, speaking of the um, casino proposal, there's an opportunity for residents on Monday afternoon to be heard by the legislature on their, um, their opposition if they have it for the casino. So I, I plan to attend and uh, just wanted to let residents know. That's the time to do it, to talk and appear before the legislature and let them know, because they're the ones that are going to approve the transfer of the lease. Right. Anyone on Zoom with a comment on um, an agenda item? Bob Wolf, can you hear me? Yes. You there, Mr. Wolf? I heard you.
If you can unmute. Yeah. Mr. Wolf, okay. you're muted. I'm unmuted. Good now? Yes. Perfect. I mean, what interest rate are we looking for on the bond and what term? Bonds yeah. Irene, what interest rate are we looking for in the bonds and what term? So, are you are you <clears throat> no, it doesn't sound like it is. Yeah, there. Okay. Um, Mr. Wolf, are you referring to the bond resolutions on the agenda? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the terms of the bond are determined based on the probable a period of usefulness that is listed in the bond resolution. And every bond resolution has a different period. Um, the curbs and sidewalks, for example, is 10 years. The roads are 15 years. The Meadow Street drainage project uh, is 40 years. When we issue bonds, um, what we do is we take or fiscal advisor takes um, all the different projects and calculates a weighted average of all the projects. Um, and that determines the term of the bond. Okay. Um, again, tonight, the resolutions are just the authority from the board to, um, to issue. We are not issuing bonds yet. And in, in the near future, we will probably issue these bonds um, in February of next year when our existing bans are due. So um, we don't know what the interest rates are yet. Um, the, the budget called for a lot more bonding than this. Is that, is that, all that bonding going to be done uh, in fiscal year ending um, 2024? Depending on the timing of the projects. So uh, we typically issue the bond resolutions two to three months in advance of when we anticipate starting the projects. So if those projects are started and mostly completed by the time we issue the bonds, then yes, we'll include those. Um, if not, we won't. We'll wait till the following year um, due to the fact that sometimes the amount that we estimate for these projects can come in higher or lower. Um, so we typically wait for the projects to be significantly completed before we issue the actual bonds. Um, and, and during the budget meeting, you, you referred to some bonding from previous years that we haven't opened yet. I think mostly related to the Western Firehouse. What's happening on that? Yes, yeah, so we mentioned that there were uh, four previously approved but unissued bonds. Uh, two of them are related to the village hall work that is ongoing, the HVAC project and the uh, um, the repointing or the facade of uh, the bricks. So those two projects uh, will be completed by February. So we'll issue bonds on those. Okay. Um, and then we also have uh, 1.5 million of approved bond resolution for the fire station renovations. Um, and so if, if, those, if that project is significantly completed by February, we'll issue bo uh, the bonds on that as well. Where do, we, where do we stand on that project? The fire station renovation? Yeah. I drive by, I walk by every day and nothing's going on. By station two, we just received um, some preliminary designs, uh, I believe about two weeks ago. I've sent them over to the fire chief and the fire commissioner. Hopefully we'll have a meeting within the next week or so to go over the design and we can move forward on that project. Do you think it's going to be a million and a half? You think it's only going to be a million and a half at this point? I can hear what he said. Excuse me? Do you think it could be a million and a half or a lot more? We didn't get a cost estimate with that design as of right now. I'm still waiting for that. Um, Irene, how much money, what was our cash balance at the end of April in, in the bank? Uh, for the general fund, the cash balance is at the end of April is about a little over $26 million. And uh, what's our, what, how much we're earning on that every year? What percentage? So the net interest rate we receive on uh, our cash balances, it depends on the banking institution. It ranges from 2.4% to 4.7%. And again, these are net interest rates. Um, we do have cer certain services with some of the banking institutions. So some of the costs for those services are netted out with the rates. 
Two point four sounds very low. Are That's you giving me the fund? Are you giving me the fund balance, Irene, or the cash balance? Because the cash balance sounds low to me. The twenty six million is for the general fund. That's the cash balance, not the fund balance. Okay. At the end of April. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Irene, did you say the Meadow Street drainage improvement bond was for 40 years? Did I hear that right? Or did I, I must have that it. was for 40 years. Yes. Yeah, so that Why? potentially can be financed over 40 years. Would we finance for 40 years? No. Uh, but that project is um, allowed to be financed over 40 years. To yeah. get that longer term. Mm -hmm. okay. So when we net out, like when we calculate the weighted average, it helps with, you know, the projects that are five or 10 years. So it increases the, you know, the length of time we can finance. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Another question uh, from, Zoom, from Zoom. Mr. Orris. Wait, he's back. Yeah. Oops. Good evening. You've got your time, Bob. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, I think I'd open and close the show. So I, uh, uh, I, I'm what you call it. I'm uh, interested in why we are uh, doing number 16 uh, on the agenda, which is the study uh, for speed limit reduction study in the in the village. I just went recently. I I'd gone over the 41 page report that was produced by the village. Uh, under under the uh, title of traffic calming study, uh, which goes into a lot of detail as to what could be done in the village to reduce speed and hazardous driving and so on. Not only the reduction of the speed limit down to 25, but also the, uh, the use of raised crosswalks, speed humps, bump outs, choker, traffic circles, raised medians, and so on. So I'm just wondering what we're paying for in $25,500, what additional uh, findings are they gonna produce or are they just gonna rehash what we already have? Yeah, this, this is Trustee Kelly. The study that number 16, uh, undertakes is required by state law. It's a statutory prerequisite to lowering a speed limit. And so the village has to do that before taking up the issue at a public hearing as to whether or not the uh, public supports reduction of the speed limit from 30 to 25 miles an hour. And if they do, whether the board of trustees decides to support it. But this is a study that has to be done to comply with the law as a prerequisite to lowering the speed limit. We bid it um, and this was the low bid. And this is the company we're proposing to do it. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, to move forward with lowering the speed limit, we have to conduct this study. Okay, well, that's more of, a, of an in-depth in uh, reason for that, have the study done. Uh, the biggest problem with any of these in, uh, studies or, or reduction of uh, speed limit or keep the speed limit the way it is, is enforcement. That's the biggest problem. Uh, I, mean, I, I live over here in the in the eastern section, and I have rarely see anyone complete come to a complete stop at a stop sign, and then they then they speed up between stop signs. And particularly, I'm I'm on Grove Street, and there's only one stop sign on the whole street, uh, going from Meadow all the way down to Brook, and a lot of people take that avenue in order to bypass Clinton Road. And uh, if anything, I'd uh, like to have somebody put a couple of more stop signs on, on Grove, especially goes pa going past the park. Uh, I know there's one on either, either side of the park, but I think we need more than that. 
All right. Well, thank you. Well, that, that explains it, the fact that we have to have it done because of state regulation. But I just don't want to see a rehashing of what we've already done. Thank you. Thank you. The um, Your comment about Grove Street is welcome and significant because we are trying to address traffic calming that's near uh, schools and playgrounds as a first priority. And uh, so we will certainly take that up in the traffic commission. So thank you for that. All right, any other questions um, from anyone on Zoom on agenda items? All right. Um, I do want to actually at this point thank um, residents Jeff Rothgaber, John Cantwell, and staff um, Karen Altman and Ryan Sheehan for our first Zoom webinar session tonight. You may have noticed it's a little bit different. Um, it, you no longer have to request the link and have it emailed to you. So this should make it easier for people to join our meetings, even if they didn't think of it a few days before. So thank you all for making that happen. There's one item I think we overlooked in the um, descriptions or the summaries, the library declares sole source. Does anyone wanna explain that or comment on that? Okay, hello. I heard things are looking great over there. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think they really are looking great. Uh, it'll look better when we get it all set up and open. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for calling on me tonight. Uh, the library is requesting board authorization to approve uh, the sole source vendor of uh, comprised technologies to provide us with what we call a smart payment kiosk. This is to help users who pay for printing or normally we, we just have a kiosk downstairs in the computer lab, which only takes cash, coin or, or currency. So you can't pay by vendor card. And on top of that, we also offer wireless printing in the library. So if you're upstairs and you wanna print, you have to go down to the computer lab to get your job and you have to pay for it with cash. So the intent is to purchase two of these smart payment kiosks, one for the first floor so that you can release your job to a printer on the first level and one downstairs in the computer lab so to expand the payment options. And it has to be a sole source because it interfaces with technology, uh, with a software system that we use through NASA library system for all of our uh, network use and um, the time management system. Okay, any questions? All right, thank you Larry, Thanks very much. Do you have any comment on that? No. It has to be a sole source because it interfaces with- I mean, it would make it easier. I mean, it would make it easier than questions about how the security is handled, right? Because that's the thing. So we use a time management program called SAM, and that is licensed to National Library System. They do a cooperative purchase, and it interfaces with our network systems, which we share through National Library System. So we're already using this one proprietary software, and Comprise, who is the manufacturer of SAM, is the company that manufactures the kiosk. So it'll interface with a time management software that the patrons are using in the computer lab. So just, do you have a ballpark number of what the cost is? Um, I didn't bring that number with me. We do have the funds budgeted already in our technology line. I believe each kiosk is in the range of about $10,000, but I'm not sure. It includes a computer screen. It includes the uh, coin and, and currency uh, mechanisms and the software that's necessary to run the, uh, run the tool. And these are the only folks that provide this software that interfaces with the Nassau County Library System? The, the software that we're using, it's not, so the Comprise software that does the time management is manufactured by Comprise, and this is their kiosk that provides the payment via card or cash. We're already using, like I said, a regular, uh, their regular tower that didn't offer the debit and credit option. This one offers the debit credit option as well, so. Okay, that's fine. Uh, is there a date scheduled for the opening of the children's room? No, not yet. Uh, we did have our walkthrough last week with um, the architect uh, leading and the contractors were on site. We had uh, Ralph and Giuseppe with us as well as library representatives and library trustees uh, present. And um, there's approximately 50 item punch lists. We also had a walkthrough today, myself, 
Ralph, uh, Ralph from the library, uh, Giuseppe, and uh, two of our trustees that are here tonight to um, review the status of those punch list items. And some of them have already been worked on uh, by the furniture vendor and the carpet vendor. But the main thing we're working on uh, getting done are some modifications to the circulation and children's reference desk because we need to put the computers on the desk and the grommet holes and some of those areas need to be repaired and uh, finished better before we start running the technology through the desk. As soon as those grommet holes are done, to our satisfaction for safety reasons, we'll be installing computers and phones on the desks right away. Thank and then you. everything else that follows. Yeah. Thanks. There's nothing There's nothing going on there that we, that we keep the CO from being issued, but it's it's the small details. We'll make sure things are done before they vacuum and clean, get everything going. Right. Yeah, we, we have more or less, we have Giuseppe and uh, Eric Hewler's approval to move forward. It's really just that I don't, you know, these uh, there's some sharp edges on these grommets. And as soon as those are filed off satisfactorily, I think we can at least start the initial steps to uh, moving everything in. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We look Thank forward you. to seeing everybody there soon. Thanks. Mr. Lardy? Yes. I'm sorry. I just have a question on, on that item that wasn't elaborated on. Sure, come up to the microphone. Thank you for allowing me to come back up. Uh, Steve Alotti, Meadow Street. Uh, on that item, um, $20,000. I'm not sure what, what they charge for a printout, if it's 10 cents or 15 cents, but it would be, you know, a 10 cents, 200,000 printouts to recoup that money. And is the library getting all that money? Is a vendor uh, getting a portion of it to service the machine and handle the money? Um, are we sure there isn't another vendor that may be able to interface with that or provide that service for a cheaper amount? It just seems like $20,000 to be collecting, you know, 10 cents and 20 cents from people or 40 cents. Um, it's going to take an awful long time to recoup that money or the machine will be needing to be replaced before we do. And does it make sense to maybe just have free printouts and put that $20,000 someplace else or not? But I think those questions need answers before we, we move ahead with an expense like that for um, what you may be getting back from it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments on agenda items? Anyone on Zoom? No? Okay. Any citizen comments on non-agenda items? Come on up. Kathleen Orrell for Maryland Avenue. Each day as I leave my corner, which is Marillon and Nassau Boulevard, on my way into the village. I have to go through right near the high school. Actually, it, it, it might be the concern of the county rather than a village road, but the roadbed in front of the high school as I'm traversing to go into the village is horrific. And most of us who are leaving Marillon Avenue and we do have the right of way. The stop sign is on Rockaway, although you would not have known it when I was coming here tonight, but that's, that's another point I'll raise. But most of us, or I should say a number of us, as we are trying to avoid this very rough patch of road, want to go into the left lane to avoid all the bumpy de bumpy de bump the patchwork. Now, I don't know, as I said, is this a village section of a road or it could be county? That I am not sure of. But whoever it belongs to, fix it, would you please? Because so many of us try to get across to the left lane. Mm -hmm. And as tonight, as I had to stop and I had the right of way to come here tonight, a Garden City school bus and three other vehicles went through their stop sign, crossed 
the left lane and ended up that I had to put my brakes on to let them in the right lane where I should be driving, but I don't want to because of the rough roadbed. So I was going to ask the commissioner, maybe this would be a, a great intersection to have somebody there because it is not the only time that I've had to stop this week for cars who are really not adhering to that stop sign. Now I have heard people tell me that it's very difficult and, and the line for the stop sign is, is very close to Maryland Avenue because of the very large shrubbery there, but that still does not give them the right to blow the stop sign. That's always been a problem. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That's always been a problem, Kathy. And I know if I'm going in the other direction, heading oh, in a western direction. I always direction, put my direction I, along. Exactly right. You have to, otherwise they'll cut right in front of you. That's right. And the section of road you talk about, I'm just smiling because every time I want to do that. It's like the Baja. Or and the you're right taking your, your life in your hand because you're looking over your shoulder from the guy who's coming from um, Old Country Road, who should be at a stop sign. And you're trying to avoid that. But yeah. just as I said, um, if we could look into somehow. Superintendent Baroni wanted to say something about the road and its condition. I, I would suspect that the con bad condition is on the county portion of the road. I'm sure. We yes. recently paved Marilyn a few years ago. Right. So uh, we'll take a look and we'll put the county, we'll send a note to the county. I, I know it's been patched, but the patchwork isn't that great anymore but I figured it was county but I wanted to bring it up to the attention of the village anyway because it's disconcerting when <laughs> when you're going over that ro road that as Bruce has already said that's, Thank all, you. that's also an area that the county has been talking about correcting that intersection making more of a traditional T uh, I, don't, I don't think that's why they're holding off on repairing it let's get that note out to them but that's also on the traffic mission agenda are we bringing up a traffic light again there that's what I, I haven't seen the final plans, but I think that was what I heard when I spoke to them. They want to put two traffic lights there. Well, having had six children go to the high school, those same six going to the middle school, if you put a traffic light at that intersection, the traffic is going to be backed up at school hours that is going to be ridiculous. So just a concerned citizen who has traveled that way many years for whatever it's worth <laughs> thank you kathy yes jeanette mclaughlin manor road I, this is in reference to uh the quick questions today and the request for westerman's questions that you had to westerman and the responses what will the process be to obtain that information to get the um, questions and answers. Yeah, yeah, it said to, I think Mr. Salem, he had requested yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I can send yes. it to you too. I don't know if there's, they're all foilable. I don't know if it's, you know, worth posting any place, but I'm happy to send it to you. I, right. Just I figured the they're going, you know, that people who are interested are probably getting them anyway, because I've, so well, I'll send it to well, you. You'll send it to me. Thank sure. you. And if anyone, anyone interested can send me an email, I'm happy to share it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Good evening, uh, Bolabrook, Kenmore Road. Congratulations Hi. to all of you who were elected. Um, uh, first item, I just want to talk about a couple things about St. Paul's. Uh, first of all, I happen to notice as I was driving by that all the vegetation and the ivy are growing back up on the walls. Um, if, you, if you know anything about that, that is what causes damage to the building. So I don't think it would be difficult for us to go in there and just simply cut it all away and take care of it. Uh, hopefully the board would consider doing that. I appreciate it. Uh, the second thing is, is that um, with St. Paul's options, I appreciate the actions that you've done. Uh, it no longer is one preferred, preferred choice. Uh, I think you guys actually have a great opportunity to bring this to a very fair vote to where we could decide um, what we want to finally do with the building. Um, I do think, though, that you have to consider that the cost of whatever we do, whether it's park or whether it's uh, renovation of the building, 
is only half the item. It's not the whole item. The other half of the item is what is the estimated cost of whatever you do. For example, you have a 105,000 square foot building. Let's assume that you're gonna renovate that building. You probably would need to be conservative, hire 10 employees. If you hire 10 employees, all in cost between benefits and everything is probably about $150,000 an employee. You're looking at $1.5 million per year for every year going forward for this village. That's before you heat it. That's before you put AC in it. That's before you run electricity. So I think that when you present the options to the residents, you're gonna to have to sit there and you're gonna to have to have someone who can say, okay, for whatever we do for the next, you don't have to go out 40 years, but you could say for the next 10 years, what would be the cost to run a park? What would be the cost to run a renovated building? And you need to put that down realistically because if we're sitting here and let's just say conservatively, if we added another $2 million or $3 million to the village budget, that's a significant amount. Uh, the main reason that I actually came out here to talk tonight was because I watched the last meeting and I watched the unbelievable one-sided comments that were made about the promenade. And I just, I, I was, I couldn't believe what I was watching. Uh, first of all, I just want to talk about John Wilton. Uh, he doesn't know I came here tonight, but I have to say, and I say that before I make my comments, uh, John is an amazing person. Um, if you sit there and think about it, he's probably one of the strongest driving forces in our community and for our businesses and the promenade. If you think about it, he coordinates everything. He coordinates the bands. He takes care of Belmont. And when there was COVID, he was the number one person who helped support our business. And in my opinion, I think he's earned all of our respect. Just my opinion of him. Now, what have we heard about, or what have you heard about the promenade? Women being accosted. Gangs of teenagers on bikes, terrorizing residents everywhere. And resident, one of the residents, one of the gentlemen who came up here, talked all about the children. Imagine running all over the place. Must have said the word disgusting five times. And by the way, thank you for your comment, which you said at the very end, you know, believe it or not, there were actually good things about the promenade. So if you think about it, first of all, most of the people who live on 7th Street, and again, I understand it's a balance when you run a program like that, because you have the people who live on 7th Street and you have all the rest of the residents who come there. The majority of the residents live probably far enough away from 90% of the activities of what goes on at the 7th Street Promenade. If you think about it, the majority of the activities run from key food east. You're not seeing a ton of things down by Chase Bank. You're not seeing a lot of activities there. I'm not saying the kids don't go down there, they don't go. But the majority of the bands, everything else is all in front of Pizzeria G, is down by Leo's, is down by whatever. In addition to that, if you also take a look, this is not the first time that people have come up against the Promenade. When the promenade first became um, active, and especially when we had COVID and we ran it several more times, there were several businesses, and Karen Altman probably has a copy of the letter that was sent. And that letter stated that the promenade was taking away from businesses dramatically. It was affecting their livelihoods. And it was signed by 18 businesses on 7th Street. So when we got the letter, and by the way, the first change that they made was that instead of starting it, if you remember, we used to shut down the street. I think Commissioner Jackson, I think we used to shut it down at three. Um, now I think you're shutting it down at like five. Okay, so that was a big difference because again, they used to complain that they couldn't have people going to their businesses. But one of the things I did was I said, okay, this is interesting. So why don't I call the businesses and find out when they close. Of the 18 businesses that their business was being totally taken away by the promenade, they closed at six o'clock. Two of them closed at 6.30, one of them closed at seven. Every single business, I asked the question, I'm not the brightest can in the room, but you have anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 people, customers, potential customers. Why don't you stay open? Absolutely not. So it was, that's not the first time you've heard comments against the promenade. Now, what are the benefits? 
This is a huge support for our businesses. The businesses who are part of this program, it was a lifeline to them during COVID. And many of them see a tremendous amount of people come there. You have families everywhere who come. It's a fantastic place for our teenagers to go. Biggest complaint that everybody sits there and says, hey, my kid is sitting there in front of the video game. He doesn't do anything all day. The kids have no place to go. Well, they do. And they go to the prominence. And when my wife and I walk around there, I see them all running around. And it's a fantastic thing to see. In addition to this, amazingly, parents come with their small children. My gosh, they actually sit there and they watch the music and the kids dance around. And they go and they get their ice creams and they have a fantastic and they have a great time. And if you think about it, seniors are there too. They're bringing their chairs. They're enjoying the music. And the children activities that are going on there, face painting, balloon makers, everything you can think of. So the only thing I ask this board is, I understand you're trying to make a balance between the people who live there and everything that goes on in the in their place. But the promenade, is a tremendous, unique event that our village holds. And at least to me, that's where our tax dollars should go. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right, sir. Anyone else in the room with any comments on um, non-agenda items? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Lucano. I live on Houston Road, and uh, I really wanted to take this opportunity tonight to thank uh, Commissioner uh, Baroni for all the hard work he and his crew have done down at the Maryland Avenue Station. And we have a we call ourselves the Maryland Committee, and we work hand in hand with Trustee Chester um, to try to get some ideas and and put them forth. And we've emailed and we've texted and everything else. So tonight I have a short presentation. Once again, it's probably around a dozen slides or so, so I'll try to be brief, but uh, I think, again, a picture paints a thousand words so you can see it. And I did put verbiage up there. Um, this is uh, Maryland Avenue uh, station looking north, as you can read. And I, if from, this is from talking to the people on the committee, added a no left turn sign right there. I think it's really important because if you could see the no left turn across the street, it's kind of far away and it's in the shadows. And by the time you get to plantings and everything else there, I don't know how much money that would be, but we're just talking about safety. And that's really what I'm talking about, not parking here and parking there. It's all about safety. And I think uh, Commissioner Brony's done a fantastic job down there. So this is a kudos to him. And that's uh, step one, step two, slide two. You take a right turn and now you're approaching Nassau Boulevard. And as you see, there's a stop ahead sign and kind of tweak that a little bit by putting a curved arrow to signify that in that left lane, you're making a slow turn. You're not going straight down towards the high school crossing over Nassau Boulevard. It has a straight arrow right there. It's just a little tweak to it, whether it's important or not. I think it's, uh, you know, lets drivers know that right around that bend, there's a stop sign. Nowhere else but around that bend. And uh, I know that that mailbox is going to be moved soon. It's going to be moved. It has to because that's an active roadway, Kathy. Um, All right, don't fight, people. We're not going to fight about it, but that is going to be moved. That is, I can't sit there when there's traffic now that wasn't an active roadway, Kathy. And I'll tell you why because that cross hatch was all the way to the island and that was illegal to cross through. So, so now it is not, now it is legal to cross. So next slide. And finally, we come to the stop sign. And I was kind of concerned about it because I watched the cat and mouse game a little while ago with people coming across Nassau Boulevard and people coming around the island, where do we go? But um, the word stop, the arrow and the line in combination with the stop sign, has worked fantastic. I put a check mark on that because that there's no change necessary for that. So we round the bend and we come up upon the uh, parking area, the pickup drop off area on the right. And there's a pedestrian crossing sign on the right, as you can see. But uh, this idea was put forth by the committee member, um, uh, uh, 
Vassilotti, Tom, uh, trying to get his name, Robert Vassilotti, sorry. And he thought it was a good idea to put that portable uh, pedestrian crossing sign that we have downtown Garden City right by Baskin Robbins. So everybody's familiar with that. And the reason that is done is because if there's a high profile vehicle parked on the right side, pulling away or parked or anything else, you really can't see the whole thing. So I think it's an easy fix and that pedestrian crossing sign can be moved if there's snow plowing in the winter as such. And that's uh, kind of a silly picture. I didn't, you know, it was hard to do, but if it's close to the uh, crosswalk and back, you know, on the, on the uh, side of the handicap parking, I think that would be a good place for it. Then coming up to uh, uh, the next stop sign with the stop line and, um, and the uh, pedestrian crossing, everything there is great at Wellington Road. There's no problem. That is a, uh, you can do a U-turn there or a left turn. You have to kind of go to the right side a little and go up and make a left turn around the island to go back to Nassau Boulevard, but it can be done. And this is the next crossing. It's up by um, Roxbury Road. And um, I have two, two slides on this same view. The next slide, you can see how there's a road narrow sign there. Um, it's very good. It's a good crosswalk and everything. It's just very hard to take a U-turn around. I don't think many people will do that. If they're leaving the station, they wanna go back to Nassau Boulevard. I think they're gonna take the first one at Wellington, so they're not gonna take this. This can be done, but you have to go further down west, almost to the uh, uh, curb line and then make a U-turn. And this is beautiful, um, a, lo a long time in, in, uh, in the works, uh, Main Avenue at Wellington Road, eastbound. Um, I personally stood on that sidewalk with my iPhone on video and I watched cars blowing through that with a stop sign on there before the stop line and the word stop was written. As soon as it was written there, they're stopping, full stop. They're looking both ways. There's two crosswalks there. It's a really active area now with the construction. There's a lot of crosswalks and people are getting off. They're using the station more. Um, so it's really important to have all these safety features and I uh, commend uh, Commissioner Baroni on that. And if you continue down, uh, this is uh, the intersection of Houston Road on the right and the island on the left. I wanted to add a pedestrian crossing sign on the left. There's nothing there now. That's just added there as a piece of artwork because people are crossing and cars are driving through and you really can't, um, you know, you, you need a little extra there besides just a crosswalk. So that's why I have that there. So that could be another safety feature. The next one, um, again, by Robert Vassilotti, uh, he brought this up. He said, why are there different um, parking signs by different stations? On NASA Boulevard, we have a two hour parking, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. At uh, uh, Maryland, we have no parking, 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, I'm just talking about the first two now. And I don't really, I can't really answer that. I think that people, you know, will park when they have to. Uh, a lot of people drop cars off uh, and then their, their family members, let's say, get off the train and then they pick up the car and they drive away. What we're trying to avoid now that the station has all this parking, um, we don't want a lot of cars on the side streets. We don't want them up Wellington and Houston and Roxbury. There's no need for it. There's enough parking there now. If they have to do it, um, they get a two hour window maybe, or do they get a window that goes from 12 noon to let's say six, seven at night. So it's something to consider. Um, I, I don't know why it's different at two different stations. Maryland's pretty big now. It's not a smoky little stop anymore. Um, number three is something that I feel I'm adamant about. Uh, I think that the roadway now should have no parking or standing or at least no stopping. Um, now with all the crosswalks, there's people just walking anywhere across the islands and they need to use the crosswalks. But the reason they're not is because their family member or friend is now picking them up and deciding to stop on Maine or Maryland. And I think that that needs to not have a, a, a that thoroughfare cannot have uh, stopping on it. It really can't. And that's just from Roxbury Road, I think, to Nassau Boulevard. Um, but Commissioner Jackson, maybe you want to look at that and and think about 
um, if there's a traffic study or somebody would say, you know, is that dangerous or not? I think that everything I'm putting forth from our committee is just safety number one. We don't want anything to happen. There's bus stops, there's school children, there's kids on bikes. I think it's very important. And I told Trustee Chester, I'm not even going to talk about um, the uh, Telemore playground up the road because I think having parking on two sides of that street um, is kind of crazy because the kids darting back and forth to their parents' car and balls going over. I think maybe one side of that street would be fine and the other side that no parking or standing would be would be okay on that side. But all in all, I think it's a fantastic job um, and everybody's very pleased with it. Um, just a couple of tweaks may help it a little, along a little more to make it super safe for residents and visitors. So that's it. Hey, Billy. Um, I will, I'll send it to you. Yes. Billy, um, one of the reasons that there's the two hour parking sign in the Nassau Boulevard area is because a lot of residents um, that live in the, from Nassau Boulevard to Adelphi University used to have a lot of students um, parking their cars in the area. And they'd stay all day. And, and they'd the stay all day. So they had requested that there was a limit on the parking there, either guests that were coming to Adelphi. And this was years ago. It was before Adelphi had redone things and have a lot more parking, but that's why that's there. That it's makes they, a lot of sense. The residents requested it. So if the residents request that same sign down by Maryland, just to prevent all that parking on the side streets, I don't see it yet. There's a lot of construction going on. There's uh, homes being built and everything else, but that could be something maybe to be brought up later at a later date. Well, I had mentioned to you, Bill, you know, on we did it on our block in Kensington and Brixton did right. because commuters were parking there yeah. like all day. And we came down and we said we want the sign and the village put the signs up with the two hour limit. So you, know, you like, did the two hour also. Yeah. So it's yeah. very think, rare to see a no parking 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Right. That's only for a few blocks in there by Maryland when it was a smaller station. So that's what I'm saying. Just consider that. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know how anybody feels about the no parking or no standing or no stopping oh. on that. Are you talking about that? No parking or standing on the entirety? No, only on the south side of Maine uh, from Roxbury to Nassau, pretty much, because I think that. the station... Oh, no, I understand. Right. Now. That's a that's a I think that's a great idea. Now, right. you had something else up there, which was two signs hooked together. You had a no left turn. Oh, right. That was the, the stop first sign. slide. Very first slide. There it is. Yeah, it looked crazy to me. Now, Commissioner, do you have any? I haven't seen that configuration putting two signs together. Are you familiar with that? Um, sometimes, uh, some instances you can have two or three signs. It's quite common. Uh, the only thing is sometimes uh, I'm not sure if they really like putting signs on a stop sign. If they say take away, they might be able to uh, put a sign somewhere else. Uh, but it's that is a far that is a far look, and a lot of times yeah. in those type of intersections they will recommend. I mean, we live in town. Everybody, you know, all the trustees. But if you're a visitor and you're coming and you're having Thanksgiving dinner and you had a glass of wine, you might take a left turn right there because you're not seeing that sign across the street. You know you're not going to go straight across the aisle. Because it looks like it's far away. It is pretty no far No left away. turn Well, sign. I'm back a little ways, but it is, you know, it will be in shadows of the trees and the plantings and all that. So I I just thought, and I researched that, that, that no left turn sign is below stop signs all over the country and there's a third sign sometimes that goes below that sign it's a little rectangular sign and that i think is overkill you don't need that it has some verbiage on it to me that that says it all and that's uh we can look at it that's that's already approved yeah so, uh, what we can do is we can uh talk to some uh, mm -hmm. and see what he thinks yeah as an agent of that location but that's already approved so we can we can enhance it because it's already approved yeah all right yeah. yeah, yeah. With a uh, review of the METCD and the Commissioner Jackson's um, review, right. uh, we'll take a look at that in section. There's a possibility we might be able to paint a right turn arrow on the ground instead of putting a sign on the on the channel pole. But we'll take a look. Sure. Thank you, Bill. I think Bob. Bolt right turn only. Okay. 
like I said, these are just ideas and they're all based on, let's have it the safest area now. There's a lot of activity. And I think uh, Mr. Baroni has, you know, 90 something percent of it. It's, it's great. It flows nicely. And uh, we just need people to start using the crosswalks and not, you know, cut across the grass islands because their spouse or uh, son or daughter is waiting for them at the station parked on the road. Thank you. Thanks for all this work. Um, amazing job with the volunteers, our village staff, Trustee Chester. So uh, appreciate everybody working so well together. Welcome. Well, I'm just the area. voice. We have, uh, you know, eight people on the committee and uh, I don't think anybody really could make it tonight. So it's fine. These are all their ideas. So we put them all together. Did a great Thank presentation, you. Bill. I think Bob Bullerbrook has a question for you. I was just going to make a comment that he was correct. Those times where I've seen them in other communities, the only thing is in most communities where I have seen the combination of the song, the pole itself is actually higher. Yeah. What they do is they move the height of the pole, maybe another two feet. So this way then both signs are in the viewpoint of the driver. Mm -hmm. So even if you think you want to do that, my suggestion would be just like other communities have to just raise the height of the pole. For those on Zoom, Mr. Bulbrook just shared that he's seen this done other places. We may want to just consider raising the height for the visibility. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we need to go by the uh, denying the loophole and stuff. So, like, sometimes, uh, when they allow it, we've got to check it. Uh, but sometimes, if it's because it's from other places, it might not be so supported for the manual. And I think it's a seven foot, seven foot, uh, seven foot height. So, when Mr. Bulbrook was saying, you can, we might, if we can do that, we'll look at that. Great. Well, we need, I think, a similar thing. Am I right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just one thing I wanted to respond to Mr. Bolowick's comments before. Um, it was, I did not take it all lightly, the decision to, to cut down on the promenades. I think they're a wonderful community event as well. P families come out, spend time together. Um, but it did um, come to a point where we had to consider we want to keep it safe and family friendly. And the complaints, and I know there have been complaints for years, but they rose to a level where we had to uh, make a little change for this coming year. After the year, we can look at it again. And we're looking forward to, I think they're great events and we want them to be fantastic for the community. We have heard a lot of positive uh, feedback and people I know who are disappointed that they're being um, reduced the number but it's really an attempt to make them great and continue them on because I think they are a nice enhancement to the community. All right, any other comments um, in the room? Anyone on non-agenda items? Anyone on Zoom with any comments on non-agenda items? It's another quick comment, guys. Yeah. There's another quick comment guy. Mr. Salem, are you, can you unmute? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. hear you. Um, uh, there's clearly a banking crisis in the United States right now. <clears throat> and everybody has bank accounts that have been questioned because of the safety of the bank that uh, where the money is deposited. Um, I'm concerned whether the village has checked out all the banks that we have our money in. Uh, I, I think, is it four uh, banks that we use? I don't remember. Um, does Irene, could she tell us? No? Uh -huh. Yes. Hello, Mr. Salem. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, at the last uh, uh, board meeting, we uh, the board approved the investment policy, which lists all the banking institutions that the village does business with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our, our main operating account is the uh, is JP Morgan Chase. Um, mm -hmm. And then we use other banking institutions for investment purposes. Um, mm -hmm. We use Capital One Bank as well. The, the Village Justice Court uses them. Um, and then we also this year uh, joined New York Class, which is a municipal cooperative 
uh, for investment purposes, which gives us uh, extremely favorable rates. It's compounded um, daily rates. Uh, so we're, we're doing very well with that. We do look at the banking institutions. We have good relationships with our banks. Uh, we obviously have, um, we, we, we follow the guidelines. Uh, there are rules in terms of which banking institutions the village can invest in and utilize. Um, and of course, you know, it has to be very safe investments that the village uh, utilizes as well. It is taxpayer funds. We have to be very careful about that. Um, so, you know, we, we always monitor that. We also ensure we only do business with uh, banks that have a, a government uh, business unit, right, that they do business with other municipalities as well. Where, where is the $26 million deposited? Uh, could you tell us, uh, not the amount, but which other? Oh, yeah. So uh, I think I do have that. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, our main operating account with the villages with J.P. Morgan Chase. We have uh, investments with Capital One, TD Bank, uh, m and which was formerly People's United Bank, and New York Class. Mm. And uh, do we know how much money is uninsured of, of the uh, deposits that we have? All, all our deposits are, ins are insured uh, either through FDIC or collateralized. It is a requirement that we make sure that uh, all our, our deposits are collateralized, the entire amount. In fact, it exceeds our amount, the amount that we have to, in, on deposit. How, what is it collateralized with? The banks, the banks ensure that, you know, they cover the difference that's not uh, covered by uh, the, 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 the federal, the FDIC number. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So I would imagine that JP Morgan has by far the biggest uh, deposit that we have of the 26 million. No, we maintain a, an operating balance there. Um, enough to cover our, you know, disbursements. We also receive most of the revenues into that account as well. Um, most of our deposits are held in our investment accounts. Um, which banks then? Capital One, TD Bank, um, and New York Class. Okay. Um, but I guess, I, I, I mean, it might be good to give some color. This is not sitting in a savings account right these fund these funds are not sitting in a savings account right they're being they're being invested in other products that are that are again low risk from an investment standpoint correct we're talking that's correct about, we're basically we've invested in in cds and td and in treasury bills um and money market accounts that provide us you know higher interest rates of course mm -hmm. all right well my concern is the health of the bank there are lots of banks that are uh being questioned just because the, the deposits in those banks are not insured by the FDIC. So uh, it's just a question of whether we have researched the health, the financial health of all the banks that we deal with. That, that the health of those banks can be determined in many ways. It could be uh, their Moody's, if they're rated by Moody's or S Standard & Poor's, uh, or you could even watch the price of the stock. If the stock is acting poorly in the market, price of the bank stock, uh, that could be a warning sign. And um, I, the banks that we've not been worried about in the past could be worried about in, in the current terrible environment we're in. So that's, I'm just concerned if one of these banks should end up in near bankruptcy, not not uh, JP Morgan, but you know, MNT and well, TD, I guess, is they're, they're backed by Morgan Stanley now. Um, but anyway, that's I, I just think we should use uh, uh, more care than ever in knowing where we put our money. Thank but, you, good idea, George. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Any other uh, 
comments on Zoom on non-agenda items? Mr. Baslati? You need to unmute. Yes, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. We hear you now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, because the controls are a little different with this uh, system. I just wanted to mention that uh, the controls seem to be more in, in your guys' hands, and uh, so it's a little odd, odd for uh, a Zoom uh, caller. At any rate, uh, it is easier to find the link. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, piggyback on to uh, Bill Locano's excellent presentation on the Maryland Avenue uh situation and and thank everyone in the village who's been uh involved you know uh bruce and john and uh giuseppe and ralph and and everyone else that's uh you know police commissioner fire commissioner who's been you know really reviewing this area fully and um i guess the only thing i'm wanted to add to bill's excellent um visuals there was you know just one more block uh, further west is uh meadbrook and there's two posts uh, look like they were put in the ground with no uh, pedestrian signs uh, mounted to them yet. So we just need to get a pedestrian sign at Meadbrook because there's a crosswalk there with the last westbound uh, platform exit. So that should be looked into. Cars are pretty yeah, what's, what's that going. What's that going to be, Mr. Baroni? What signs are going The uh, pedestrian signs for that intersection are in order. We put the channel poles in. We just haven't had the signs yet to put. Oh, so we're waiting for the signs. Right, right. That's that's what I figured. Yeah. So, okay. So thank you. And um, the only other thing there is um, on Maryland, of course, is is the plantings. And I, I, I know planting season is is prime right now uh, with all the rain we've had. With, uh, I just don't know what the timing is on the plantings for the for the traffic islands there. And I also am curious for the plantings uh, north of Maine, between Maine uh, Roadway and the station platform, there's a lot of miniature plants that they put there that we're hoping that are replaced with larger plantings. So I just don't know the timing of the plantings there, if someone could answer that question. And then I just had one more comment on a railroad issue. Mr. Vassalotti, the uh, bid for the Main Avenue plantings will be posted tomorrow. Uh, special thanks to Irene and Cassie from the Finance Department. Uh, the bid opening will be May 11th, and uh, we will have it on May 18th. I'm sorry, the bid opening will be May 18th, and we'll have the uh, award on the June 1st meeting. Okay. Um, that's really good and terrific, but I'm going to tell you, we're going to need to really water these things uh over the summer because it's going to probably be a hot dry summer but uh, i'm glad it's it's moving along and, it, and it's getting there and uh um all we need is a little bit more patience and, and we'll be fine after four and a half years um <laughs> but at the same time thank you very much and i'm glad that's all in progress and hopefully they do a great job um so just one other thing on the long island railroad um while they're still active over there at cherry valley with the with the uh, bridge they put in by the middle school. Uh, there's still uh, some scaffolding there and there's some, still some work going on there. Um, I hope we can grab their attention to really finish that area um, and maybe get some money out of them to do the sidewalk on the Eastern side of Cherry Valley uh, as it passes under that bridge from uh, what you'd call uh, Sixth Street Cathedral entrance there to um, to Stewart, if they could redo that sidewalk, where, which is flooding, and they should, they do need to check the drainage there. Uh, and then on the on the west side of Cherry Valley, again going under the bridge and coming towards the middle school, uh, they really need to plant uh, some lawn and uh, restore that uh, area that they put the sidewalk. They put a new sidewalk there, but they did not do the uh, planting there. And so what happens is the sidewalk drops off about eight inches and a kid could fall very easily on their bike or someone could break an ankle walking. Um, that sidewalk is really dangerous right now, the way it exists. Um, so we just need to keep after whoever our contact is there uh, to finish you know, both sides of that roadway and to restore any plantings that they can along there. They did cut a few trees uh, south of the bridge, um, a number of trees actually. 
so whatever they can do to restore the plantings and particularly the lawns and the sidewalk on the on the uh, the lawn on the west side and the sidewalk on the east side. So um, that's something to consider. My, and my, my very last comment uh, for the evening is I know that um, uh, Paul mentioned earlier about $2,900 for the Adelphi Theater, which is, you know, not the biggest number, but, you know, we pay our bills. And I think that's something we, you know, um, as a village are, I guess, proud of doing. So, um, but the thing I'm thinking about is, are they paying us the 25,000 for the parking? And do we know if they've paid that in the last two or three years for the parking at the uh, community uh, park where the pool is? A good question, Rob. So, you know, we're paying them 2,900. Right, he, uh, Robert, uh, uh, Ralph's gonna answer that question. Wait a second. Ms. Vaslotti, um the Adelphi $25,000, in the eyes of the Adelphi trustees is uh, monies that they align with the use of the parking, which during the COVID years, they did not take advantage of. So there was no money forthcoming from them. Um, but the current year, I believe they, they are using it now, right? Right, so I, um, my contact at Adelphi is retired. Um, I will reach out to the person Again, to see uh, who my new contact is, I'll see if we encourage them to get the current year caught up. As far as the sidewalk on the on the um, east end of Cherry Valley at the Cherry Valley Trestle, uh, Ms. Baroni and I, um, during the conversations, we worked that up earlier last year. We have included in the budget. We've also talked to the county about uh, their role in. Uh, putting the uh on the northeast corner of six sixth street on the um to put a uh a, a ramp there for pedestrians coming across the crosswalk that we will attach to uh we have reached out to the railroad and tried to encourage them to be really good neighbors and do it for us but we don't think that's going to happen although Surprise. we remain up, <laughs> we remain optimistic <laughs> nonetheless what are you talking about the sidewalk for the one that attaches to the uh, sidewalk that comes off of Cathedral and dead ends all the way down to the corner of 6th Street beneath the trestle on the east side of Cherry Valley. Yeah, I don't think they're going to do it. No, I think we, we have to do it. We 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 will do it. We will do it. Uh, it's, 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 it's an important it, change. Yeah. Is there anything do we as we do with the third track, there was a memorandum of understanding, much of which they haven't abided by. Um, was there anything with Cherry Valley that we had with them during the work that they said that they were going to take care of? No, the Cherry Valley, the only thing from Cherry Valley, uh, which is a verbal conversation, was, was to return the, uh, to put a stone in for the uh, original date, which they did. Um, everything else was on their agenda. Okay. Robert brought up a great point about Adelphi University. Um, let's make sure, let's get back to them, you know, on the 25,000 because they certainly keep our fire department very active. Um, there's a lot of things that they do, and I think it's time. I was going to say something about the 2,900 too. I mean, it's a small amount, but it just seems kind of annoying based on the services that we give them. Could we have a report in, at the next meeting in two weeks as to whether hopefully we'll be able to, uh, this keeps coming up that Adelphi um, hasn't been keeping up those payments. So let's try and get something in two weeks to report. Yeah, you know, I'll check on it tomorrow. Okay. okay, thanks. All right. Uh do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I so move. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all right. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I make a motion we adjourn the meeting or so move, as uh, our attorney friends would say. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. All right, good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you.